Geico presents sharing versus oversharing. Earlier this week, Claire Tippins shared a princess nickname generator, three pictures of her dog wearing a tutu, and two online quizzes, including what candy is your dream castle made of? Claire, your sharing has tipped the sugar scale and turned into oversharing. But have no fear, princess. Geico has something worth sharing with your internet kingdom, like how you can save hundreds on your car insurance just by visiting geico.com. No magic wand required. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Blog Talk Radio. And we're on live. This is History, a Traveler's Guide. And this is our special segment, History Talks. And we have a special guest today. Author Mark Barry, welcome to the show. Mark. Well, I'm glad to be here. So, anyways, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Marco. What got you into uh, dinosaurs and cinema? Well, let's see. Let me, let me see if I can make this on the, the short end of the story. Um, I guess what got me interested in dinosaurs was a combination of uh, of three things. One, um, some of the children's dinosaur books that we had in my house when I was growing up, which fascinated me endlessly. And two, I was at the perfect age when the TV show Land of the Lost came on to get hooked on that, and that was a big influence on me. And that actually is what introduced me to stop-motion animation. And then... Right after that, I started watching the matinees of the old monster movies on an afternoon show that we had on our local station called The Big Show. And they would show old films at 4 o'clock every afternoon, and they showed some Ray Harryhausen movies. And between the dinosaur books, Land of the Lost, and Ray Harryhausen, those three things combined to, to spark my interest in movies in general, Dinosaurs and special effects, and that all kinds of kind of comes together in dinosaur movies. Well, that's that is a very very interesting story. I think a lot of people get inspired into this field by reading the old books and seeing the old movies and all that, and it just makes you wonder how do these animals live and all that sort of stuff, and so. I think we got a whole round of questions for you, as interviews always do, so prepare to be bombarded. <laughs> okay. I might even be able to so answer one or two of them. With, I'm going to let Scott ask you about things about recounting films as well as with O'Brien and other films. So, Scott, have at it. I'm afraid I can just barely hear a voice. I can't make it out. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll read uh, Scott's question. He was wondering if it's a documentary about Willis O'Brien where it stated about him hunting for fossils. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, on the uh, broadcast, we are having some technical difficulties. Uh, we're resolving those issues now. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, so, anyways, I didn't catch that I last was question. Scott's question form. Uh, seen the documentary uh, about Willis O'Brien's life and how he 
actually hunt for fossils and that sort of stuff? Um, I've actually not seen a documentary about Willis O'Brien specifically. I've always wondered why there hasn't been some. But um, I actually haven't ever have never seen a dedicated documentary just about Willis. Um, it, it may, perhaps there's something out there that I'm not familiar with. But uh, I know there was, has been some planned and started, but I didn't know anything had ever been completed. Where was this available? Well, according to Scott, sorry for the delay there. According to Scott, the uh, what was it again, Scott? The uh, Lost Worlds of Willis O'Brien was the name of that documentary. I'm um, I'm not familiar with that, and uh, I've I've never really, uh, I've, of course, I've read many, many things about Willis. Um, I've never really, uh, don't recall really ever reading a lot about him being interested in fossils. Of course, he was interested in in many things. He was a big boxing aficionado, uh, which you can tell when you watch the animation of Kong, especially in the fight with the Tyrannosaurus. It's, it's full of boxing and wrestling moves. And, uh, of course, I think his first stop-motion film he ever animated was, was two clay boxers going at each other. But uh, as far as his early interest in actual paleontology or fossils, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not too familiar with that. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Greg, uh, could you take over on your questions right quick, and I'll continue trying to work on the interview here. Okay, uh, I think that took care of some of the sound issues. Uh, wait a minute, but please continue. Okay, are, are we... Are we doing another question? Uh, I didn't really have a lot to uh, answer on that one, I'm afraid. I'm uh, sorry about this, Mark. Uh, uh, let me look up a question real quick for you while we're waiting on the uh, calls to return in and all that. Unfortunately, uh, the calls have gotten dropped, and so they're trying to reconnect with us. One of uh, the questions given to us here is one of the questions we have here uh, uh, Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Greg. Uh, The question is uh, is it true that director James J. and writers Jim Avril and Ralph Lucas from Planet Dinosaurs were originally going to go for an R-rated version of the film with more graphic violence, uh, sex scenes, more candy before they decided to make a more family friendly bring her out and that picture instead. Now that you're speaking of Planet of Dinosaurs, are you speaking about Planet of the Dinosaurs, Greg? That's the question I just asked. Him. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure of the movie. Yeah. Um, it was, there were, it wasn't really a plan. It was discussed. Um, Jim O'Pearl, who of course was one of the special effects providers for that movie and with a long career in special effects, he's still active today. Um, he told me that, uh, kind of kiddingly told me that, that they, uh, that he and Steve Cherkis and, uh, Doug Beswick, who did actually did most of the animation in the movie, kind of talked Jim Shea, who was the director, kind of talked him out of, he wanted to put, uh, as Jim said, a bit of nudity in it. It wasn't going to be a real 
a real raunchy hard R type of a movie. It was he just uh, Jim Shea had discussed possibly putting you know a little bit of naughty nudity in it, but um, uh, Jim uh, Pearl and uh, and Steve Cherkis I think kind of talked him out of it. Uh, they said. Now this is kind of going to kind of be an you know an homage to Harryhausen, and Harryhausen wouldn't do that, and we don't want to do that. And um, I don't think it was ever seriously discussed, according to what Jim Pearl told me. So it was just briefly kind of tossed around, I think. And I don't think there was ever really any plan to to make it really violent either. It was just, I think there, you know, there's the scene early on where the one uh, female astronaut goes into the water and she kind of strips down to her under things and. I think maybe there was a plan to have her go a little further on that that scene and just you know a little bit of kind of innocent nudity in it, but uh, nothing beyond that. We're sharing, and uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Hey Scott, is that you? Hello. Hey, can you hear Hello. Scott. Uh, let's say thanks for thanks for answering my question, oh, Mark. Okay, uh, Scott, are you still with us? Uh oh, he just we just lost Scott again. Uh, okay, I'll run, I'll run, I'll run, I'll run one of Sam's questions for you quicker. It's about what I think that's lesson in your appendix section, Lost Worlds. I'm, I'm afraid I I didn't make that out. I'm sorry. I, I'm just not hearing that well enough to understand it. Uh, could you speak up a little bit louder, uh, Greg? But, the, the first question that Sam asked was about the unmade film adaptation of Dinosaur's Attack, and it was about whether the script was ever made for it or not. Dinosaur's Attack, yes. Um, that was... Um, of course... Gary Girani, who did the, the created the card set, the Dinosaurs Attack card set, and Joe Dante, and I think actually Will Vinton, the claymation master, were all kind of uh, players in the pre-production on that. It it didn't get very far. Um, it's um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, uh, Gary Girani himself, who like I say, who did the card set, he uh, he had written a script or at least a treatment for it and submitted it and you know it was kind of rejected and turned down and um and then according to Girani you know the the project was kind of it wasn't really going anywhere to begin with and then when Jurassic Park came along with you know the massive blockbuster status and the, based on the Crichton novel and directed by Spielberg and with you know the power of universal behind it and the groundbreaking effects and all this it, it pretty much it killed several projects, and one of the, one of the projects that, that that put the final nail in was Dinosaurs Attack. Um, it was, you know, Gerani said that you know Universal got intimidated, and or I mean not Universal, they were, you know, they they did Jurassic Park, of course, but um, that the producers and the money people got intimidated by Jurassic Park, and I said, well, we can't compete with that, and uh, so it, it just kind of fell through the fell through the cracks, and um, the 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 idea behind it that they were going to do it it started out, of course, being based very strictly on the on the cards, which of course were kind of gleefully gory. Um, it was like extreme gore, and yet it was done in kind of a fun way. Um, and then the idea kind of evolved, and eventually. The, the final version of it that was never made was sort of a, an all-out, all-out comedy, you know, with just a, kind of a gag a minute type thing in, in kind of the airplane and uh, naked gun type style humor. So, you know, it, it never got seriously far along. I, I don't think it was ever there was never a frame of film shot of it. It was uh, not even a test. It was all just discussion. And I say when Jurassic Park came along and kind of rewrote the rules, it it ended at that point. All right, then. Oh, well, I have a question for you as well, uh, Mark, about okay. 
the Willis O'Brien film called Creation. I believe some of the, the elements for it was used. And I was curious about the scene. I think there's a bit of film they actually did for it where it showed like a Triceratops mother chasing after a man that shot uh, one of the younger Triceratopses. Right, that, that's the main. Yeah, that's the main animation sequence that that actually was shot and survives from creation. Yes. So, was there any more scenes that were shot that lost film? As far as I know, just basically parts of that sequence. I mean, there there are other shots in that sequence besides just the stop motion shots. There are. It's intercut with with scenes of actual jungle animals. I think there's a chimpanzee and maybe a lion or a tiger and um, just some atmosphere shots, you know, probably stock footage at that point, uh, certainly stock footage just of uh, wild animal shots. And, you know, there's scenes of the uh, of the man with the rifle kind of stalking through the jungle a little bit and, you know, the scene that looks through the crosshairs of his rifle scope at the little baby triceratops. It's kind of a gruesome scene, actually. He shoots it right in the eye, apparently, which is kind of nasty, but... Uh, yeah. But, yeah... But that's basically it. I mean, um, there were, you know, props and even a couple of dinosaur armatures that were made for creation that were used in Kong and Son of Kong. But as far as actual film shot, all I know of is uh, is that sort of famous scene that's turned up on quite a few DVD extras is, that you that you talked about of the, of the Triceratops baby being shot, and then the one kind of two angle tracking shot of the mom chasing the guy through the brush and that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, Marion Cooper, you know, he, he when he came when they brought in Marion Cooper to to kind of save RKO, he you know, he uh canceled a lot of projects and uh he he didn't see the merit in creation. He called it just a lot of animals walking around and uh and canceled it. But the test footage and getting to know Willis O'Brien Became hugely important to the to the future of King Kong. I bet. And uh, there's a quick story. Uh, what did creation uh, as plot line? What did it actually have to do with a movie? What was its story? Or if there was any story to it? I may ask. Yeah, just um, I mean, there's. There's an extra on the Super Deluxe DVD of of Kong that sort of recreates creation with sketches and notes from the from the screenplay and storyboards. Um, I don't recall a lot of the details of it right now off the top of my head, but basically it's a it's a rich American who is kind of got this par, uh, diverse party on a, a yacht and, and they, they encounter like a earthquake tsunami you know a big force of nature and wind up in a the caldera of a giant volcano a giant extinct volcano and that's you know where they encounter the lost world type uh, environment with the with the prehistoric animals and um then then you have the sort of the disaster movie type, uh, you know, progression of things where while they're dealing with, with the disaster they find themselves in and trying to survive and evade the dinosaurs, you also have these, you know, interpersonal details and secrets and conflicts and everything that break out amongst the group. There's, there's like a romance and a triangle and greed gets involved and jealousy and all these human emotions are acted out among the, the small group amid the, you know, environment of trying to survive in this uh, prehistoric land. So it, it could have been, familiar. it could have been good, but it, you know, the, the, what survives of the, of the script is not exactly, you know, it needed work. <laughs> right. And I think I think I think Mary Cooper did the right thing, probably by canceling it and, and proceeding with Kong. Well, thanks for that. And I would have to say, it, for me, I, I've seen the uh, artistic skills as a paleo artist. 
I, there's this one impressive art still of a triceratops uh, defending itself against two smaller meat eaters. Uh, there's no the meat eaters here are not really uh, specified as to what dinosaur they were, but I guess you could say they were kind of like an old school version of a raptor in a way, and it was now being impaled upon one of the horns of the triceratops. So this film has always caught my interest for the, its artwork that was produced by it. And thank yeah, you, I mean, Greg, for bringing that up. But continue, please. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just to say, you know, that's one thing that survives from quite a few films that were never made is, is some beautiful artwork, especially if if Obi, you know, Willis O'Brien or Ray Harryhausen was involved. Or Jim Danforth, for that matter. You know, they were all three excellent artists. Quite different styles among the three of them, but they were all three excellent artists and illustrators. And uh, they all did some great, you know, production art and and just, you know, concept sketches and all that, both for movies that that were made and movies that were not made. Okay. um, Here's another question for you. This is Sam's second question. Uh, would you like me to ask it for you, Sam, or would you like to ask it directly? Would you like to ask it for me, Certainly, certainly. And the next question is, Mark, uh, were there any plans to feature a feature-length television series of, Paul, of Phil Tibbetts for Beast? Not as far as I know. Um, the plans for that ever being anything more than the short film that it is According to what Phil told me, I, I interviewed Phil back when I was writing the book originally, and according to what he told me, um, his original idea was that you know he wanted he'd, he'd wanted to do a dinosaur movie or a dinosaur feature for a long time, and um, he thought he okay he's um, he's done with the Return of the Jedi, he's finished this, the original Star Wars trilogy, and he's going to kind of take a break and from studio work and, and work on some personal projects. And so he said, okay, I will do, I'm going to do this this stop-motion dinosaur sequence or vignette and as a kind of a demo reel, and then it will also be, he had planned for it also to be kind of like an episode in this very naturalistic feature dinosaur film that he wanted to do. And then... For various reasons, after he got it done, he um, scrubbed the idea of doing of turning it into a feature, using it as, as a as a segment of a feature, and um, he sort of tried to get it into the educational market. Um, at that point, you know the the classroom films were not quite dead at that point, and um, so he thought about that uh, kind of a quasi educational, you know, short film. Um, nothing really came of that, and um, as he told me, it really never found any sort of a market. It never, it never made him any money to speak of. Of course, some animation from it did get used in a very fondly remembered TV show called Dinosaur that was hosted by Christopher Reeve. Yes, and, and I, uh, I remember. The, they, that so, has, of uh, course, most of the animation for Prehistoric Beast in it, along with some additional animation that was done just for the TV show. So, uh, uh, hold on, just one moment. Uh, Scott, are you with me? Hello? Hey, we can hear you now. Hey, this is Scott. Found a back door. Uh, I can hear you, Scott. Hello? Okay. Hello. Well, once again, uh, to our audience, uh, we apologize for these technical difficulties. Uh, we're we're barely hearing you, Scott. Uh, Maybe we I are receiving you. Know. Hang on. Okay, then. Yeah, you're and thank you, Mark, for bearing with us as we were trying to figure out the whole audio issues here. How was that? That better? Yeah, I can hear you a little bit better. All right. But uh, anyways, 
thank you for answering that question, Mark. And, uh, Greg, I believe you have the next question up. This was one of my questions here about the short film Stanley and the Dinosaurs. All right, go ahead and ask away. Uh, I'm just not really so much my question. I'm just really more about this film. All my life has been a childhood, you know, sentimental, sentiment, sentimental to me for a couple of different reasons. I just never really knew a whole lot about how it was conceived or anything, like if it was ever a TV special or anything like that. So what can you tell me about this movie? Well, it's uh, it's an interesting coincidence that that's the that's the chapter I'm you know I'm, I'm doing a all new revised second edition of the dinosaur filmography, and um, that happens to be the movie that I'm sort of working on the chapter of at this time. Um, that's actually one I missed the first time around. It should have been in the book. It came out before the book, well before the book came out, and I just I just missed it. But it will be in the new edition. And um, it's it's a great little film. Um, there's two versions of it. There's the about 16 minute original version, which all takes place in the in the prehistoric times setting. And then there's the TV version that was done about two years later, when an opportunity for a TV showing came along, and so they had to lengthen the runtime to fit a half-hour time slot minus the commercials, which comes out to about 23 minutes. So John Matthews, who was the director, producer, and writer of the movie, um, rounded up a crew, some new crew, a couple of people from the original crew, and created the framing sequences, the bookend sequences of Stanley in the modern day, where he's the, the high school student, uh, you see in the in the opening sequence where he's in the classroom and being chewed out by his teacher for not paying attention, and then he and the girl are walking along the sidewalk and they encounter the three bullies and and then they go he goes to the natural history museum field trip, falls asleep and then the original film starts and it's presented as a dream sequence, and then it ends and then there's the tag uh, back in the in the modern day world again. And all the modern day stuff is is the new footage, and the original film is the middle of the TV version, which all takes place with the with the Tyrannosaurus daddy telling the story to his to his young kid about the caveman named Stanley. And um, I I, agree, I I just recently did an interview with Joel Fletcher, who was one of the principal animators on it, and um, he and I agree that. The, the original film is the one to watch. Um, the, the new footage is, is pretty well done. It's, it's kind of got one neat thing where, they, where the, uh, the three bullies that he encounters, the Stanley encounters in the modern world, are, are paralleled by the three brutish cavemen uh, in the prehistoric sequence. They even look a little bit alike. So it's got, I mean, the, the prologue and epilogue, the new footage, was, was done by talented people. But um, it's the... It's more fun just to watch the original film, I think, just the uh, just the prehistoric scenes, and it's it's got great music. Um, you know, it was done by uh, released by Churchill Films, which was an outfit that specialized in school films, educational films for schools and libraries. And this was back in the day when 16 millimeter films would be shown in classrooms. You'd pull down the shades and the, and bring the old projector out and hope that you had somebody that knew how to thread it. And and show the kids a, a movie every now and then, and you know, this is one of the educational in, films. But you know, actually, by the time Stanley I, came along, it was it was uh, that was right at the tail end of that of that period in history. And you know, videotape was coming along, uh, school budgets were being cut, and um, the time that the, you're talking about when you would see films in 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 class projector, I, that's when I grew up in the. No, oh, me seven. too. <laughs> me too. And believe it or believe it or not, I actually when I was in elementary school, we actually did watch the sixteen millimeter film as well. Of course, my, my elementary school was a little bit behind on the times, I guess you could say. But I actually got to see them as well. 
Yeah, it, it, I always liked it when they got the projector out, you know, when I was going to school. It didn't happen very often, but every now and then we get to see a movie, and it was well, a nice change. I had my own computer projector. You could buy these films. And by Kmart, by Castle Films, you could buy your own silent black and white Godzilla movies, dinosaur movies, and a whole bunch of those. Yeah, Castle specialized in, you know, little edited down digests of, of genre films, you know. Yeah. With basically, basically, they just pick out the most, the best scenes, you know, it'd be the monster fights and, you know, all the best parts of it would be in the Castle Digest, so. So, uh, another interesting thing I just had thought of, didn't uh, Sir David Ottenborough during, I think, the 70s or 80s, did a special feature on prehistoric animals that also used stop motion effects. I can't. Uh, he may have. I I can't think of anything that Attenborough did. There were a lot of documentaries. I remember um, one with Christopher Reeve with the motion dinosaurs. Right, that's the one right, I was talking about, about earlier that earlier. used uh, some of the okay. prehistoric beast footage. Yeah, okay. All right. See, I'm missing part of the program because I was trying to figure out how to get on. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's a, that's one of the best documentaries of all time. I I'm, I guess it's not particularly accurate now, but it's it's a terrifically well made documentary with, yeah. with I say it's got great some great stop motion in it and, and it's they just a really well made documentary. Parts of that documentary was actually used in the eyewitness series of, of educational films. Uh, I remember because I had the VHS tape from when I was younger and it had featured sequences from that documentary as well. Specifically with the T-Rex and the Centrosaurus. Our next question here is from uh, our friend from Australia, Stephen Starkey, and he likes this question of you, Mark. If you had a choice, which of the dinosaur films would you like to see remake, like the old-timey dinosaur films? Which one do you think would be uh, great for a remake or a readaptation? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I always tend to think that if you're going to do a remake, you should remake a film that had a good idea or a good possibility, but it wasn't actually brought to the screen very well, rather than a movie that was really successful the first time, which is what remakes are made of usually, of course. Um, I, one film I'd like to see remade is... Um, or. Uh, not really remade. I mean, it, it has been filmed, but I'd like to see a, a really good adaptation of is um, the Land of Time Forgot. And um, I, I, I don't. I'm not somebody who's going to to criticize the the 1975 version. I actually think it's a pretty darn good movie. I love the, that movie. The, pu- the puppet dinosaurs are come and go. You know, the, the Ceratopsians come off pretty good. The meat eaters don't come off too good. But um, right. from a script and production standpoint, it's actually a good movie, especially the the whole first half of it. Really, with the submarine subplot and all that, is is really well done, and it's got a, it's got a good cast. But I still think that there would there's an opportunity there to film really all three of the Burroughs, uh, Caprona or Caspak trilogy, The Land of Time Forgot, The People of Time Forgot, and Out of Time's Abyss. You could still make a, a really good trilogy of films out of that, although. I don't know that they would find an audience uh, in this day and time. I mean, uh, they made a really good film of John Carter of Mars of Burroughs a few years ago, and it absolutely bombed. So I don't know that you'd be able to get people in the theater to see it. But um, I, it, the, the, the opportunity is there to make some really good movies out of those novels. And let's see here. Uh, we also got another question brought in from our our newest host, along with Sam, uh, Chris didn't, couldn't join us tonight, but here's his question. Of the dinosaur films you have reviewed, which ones had the most realistic portrayals of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals, and which others were the least realistic? So I guess now we're heading into the technical field here. Well, that, that's a really complicated question, because you have to uh, you have to consider... Whether if 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 it's a 
realistic depiction or not, it can only be realistic based on how much was actually known at the time the movie was made. So, I mean, the 1925 Silent Lost World was was very realistic for its day. It was it was based on pretty much the current knowledge of dinosaurs in the mid 1920s. It wouldn't be and considered that was realistic crazy. now at all. But but in a way, it's realistic because it, it was they were basing it on the best knowledge they had at that time. Um, so that's that's kind of the criteria you have to judge it by, I think. Um, you know, Jurassic Park. You know, it both was and was not realistic. It was it was very realistic in the fact that the for the first time ever, you could watch a movie and. And think to yourself, that's what a dinosaur really, really looked like. I mean, I'm a huge Ray Harryhausen fan. I love his dinosaurs. But as far as actually letting your mind imagine that you're seeing a film of a living dinosaur, Jurassic Park was pretty much the first time we had the chance to do that. So it was very realistic in that sense. Uh, the, the motion, the movements, behaviors, I think, were realistic. But, of course, then they took some huge liberties with some of the species also. Um, you know, the, the Dilophosaurus was made, you know, what, one quarter the size of a real one and given the, the frill and the poison spitting ability and all that. So, you know, in some ways it wasn't realistic at all. In other ways it was extremely realistic and extremely believable. So that's a that's a very complicated question. As far as ones that were not realistic, there's a long list of those. Of course, um, you know, you had dinosaurs played by, you know, baggy latex suits and, of course, the famous live lizards with with fins and horns glued to them and and called dinosaurs um you know very very bad puppets you know you can go down that uh toward that end of the spectrum to the point of just you know utter ridiculousness but um so I don't know if I really answered the question or not I kind of danced around it I guess but um you know, I, I think you gave a good answer there, Mark, because I, I'm with you on, you know, it depends on the times. I mean, uh, taking a look at the Lost World 1925 in particular, it was actually pretty progressive for its time because the dinosaurs were really active. And, you know, during exactly, this time, this yeah, is when I mean, dinosaur research was starting to be slowed down. You know, they started thinking dinosaurs were cold-blooded and, you know, dumb as dirt yeah, and d- everything else. But these, yeah. Most of the scientific literature had dinosaurs very sluggish, cold-blooded, reptilian, you know, you know, low-energy creatures. And and Willis O'Brien in, in the Lost World has got herds of dinosaurs, you know, almost stampeding and throwing up dust. And you've got a you've got a Tyrannosaurus, or I'm not sure if it's a Tyrannosaurus or Allosaurus, but you've got a a meat-eating dinosaur that literally leaps into the air and catches a pterosaur out of the air. I mean, and that yeah. that was hugely that was hugely progressive for the mid 1920s. Okay, and, and if you watch uh, got a- if you watch Ray Harryhausen's uh, right. one of my absolute all time favorite dinosaur scenes ever is the is the scene in the middle of one million years BC when the when the juvenile Allosaurus raids the caveman camp. I love that scene. Absolutely adore that scene, and um, that that dinosaur is very much like a Jurassic Park Velociraptor. I mean, it's 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 not very upright. It's more tilted at the hips. I mean, the tail's off the ground most of the time. Very active, very agile. Um, you know, Harryhausen and O'Brien were both well ahead of their time in depicting a- uh, dinosaurs as active. What about uh, you know, Fantasia? I, well, I love Fantasia. Um, you know, they they mix they mix their species eras a lot in that. You know, you had the big main set piece in it is a. Uh, Tyrannosaurus fighting a Stegosaurus, which is several million years apart. But uh, it's beautiful. I would, I'd give anything to have a chance to see Fantasia in a theater, projected as it was meant with the Fantasound stereo of 1940. You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to have a chance to do that. I never will probably, but uh, but that must have been something for people in 1940. I mean, I mean, they, they'd seen you know King Kong, which is fantastic, but it's black and white. And to, to see these dinosaurs in this beautiful color and with the music and everything, that must have been that must have been something to see in 1940. I wish I could yeah. have done that. I think it was a cinematic um, reproduction of the ring reptiles from that period. Are you, you, I couldn't quite make that out. You kind of broke up there. I'm sorry. I said I think that was the first cinematic representation. 
representation of marine reptiles from the Mesozoic. Plesiosaurs and Moses. That's, that's very possibly true, yes. There had been, you know, representations of pterosaurs before, but you're right. I don't think, uh, I can't think of anything that really showed the great marine reptiles of the Mesozoic until Fantasia. Well, I do recall that I think there was a brief scene in the very first animated film, or first film of a dinosaur at all, Grady the Dinosaur. I think it did feature a marine reptile, but I'm not sure if it was supposed to be an actual one or a, you know, or a fictionalized version of a sea no. serpent. Or it was something a like dragon sea serpent. Yeah, it, it was a very dragon-like sea serpent. Yeah, it was. It didn't. It did not look much like a plesiosaur. All right then. And so, uh, uh, for our next question here. This comes from Sam, and he asks, uh, was a script the unmade Hammer remake of King Kong ever produced, or was it discussed what kind of dinosaurs and other creatures would be in it? Well, I asked Ray Harryhausen about that when I interviewed him in 1998, and he didn't have a lot to say about it. Um, it didn't get very far. It really didn't get very far. Uh, Michael Carreras, who was you know the the main head honcho at Hammer at that time. It was it was it was he that wanted to do it. It was it was his desire. He really wanted to do a King Kong remake. And of course, he knew Harryhausen from One Million Years BC. And as, as Ray told me, he was unofficially committed to do the King Kong remake. I don't think anything was ever signed. But they couldn't get the rights from RKO. So that's you know. It, that's why it didn't ever go any further. They they could not get the rights from RKO. RKO would allow sequels, but not remakes of the original movie. Uh, can I and, ask a um, question? Yes. What do you will for Cassie? Say again. So what do you um, the Hammer Nessie movie? Oh, the the Hammer Nessie film. Yeah. yeah now that got further along. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I think Constar. Yeah, that got further along, a lot further along than the, uh, or somewhat further along than the, than the King Kong film did. Um, it was going to have a huge, I mean, a massive budget for a Hammer film. It was, it was the budget was like eight million dollars, which was like four or five normal Hammer gothic horror films combined. Um, and of course, it was going to be a collaboration with Toho which is just a bizarre thought to even think about Hammer and Toho collaborating on a movie. I mean, it makes well, you wish it had been made. I'm sorry, you keep breaking up. I'm, I just can't quite make out. I said Hammer collaborated with the Shaw Brothers in China, the legend of the seven gold vampires. Right. They had collaborated with people. That's that's true, yes. Um you know, of all the a lot of uh, hammer films that were planned and never made have showed up over the years, information on them. A lot of them no more than just you know, uh very, very preliminary things, but of all of all the hammer films that we've heard that you know might have been and never got made, Nessie is the one I most would have liked to have seen. That would have yeah, it might it have been one, it might have been horrible, but it would have you know, I'd like to have seen what they did with it. There's one I've read a little information about called Dublin versus Pterodactyls. Oh yes, there's you could write a whole book about that. That uh you know, that that movie has gone through more evolution <laughs> than the natural world, I think. Um it started out, as you say, as a it was going to be called Zeppelins versus Pterodactyls. At other times, it was called Raiders of the Stone Ring, and then it eventually morphed into the Prime Evils, which was the movie that David Allen, the stop motion yep, animator seen, David Allen, I've toiled for years on. That. I've seen test footage for that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of footage of that shot, but you know, at this point, it's you know. 
David tried to get it completed for years, and his associate, Chris Endicott, has, tr- has continued after David passed away to try to get it made and can get it completed in some form, and it's mm-hmm. just it's run into it's run into failure at every point um mm. and different different reasons that it's never been uh you know that there's there's still a hope that sometime somehow that it will get into some kind of finished form but i think that's probably highly doubtful at this point but but does uh, so that actually it actually traces its ancestry all the way back to zeppelin v pterodactyls mm. which is a great title for a movie i mean but who would want to see a movie called zeppelin versus pterodactyls to the Hammer movie. I thought there were two total separate projects. Okay. Uh, next question. These are from Meg uh, and Sam. Uh, all the dinosaur films you've had to watch for your book and coming right edition. Uh, memorable for you to watch. Uh, they had examples being like Tammy and the T Rex. And the 1998 Bob Keane adaptation of The Lost World, starring Patrick Bergen, and the myriad of films produced by Sci Fi Channel and Asylum. So, which one was the worst in your opinion? Ah, uh, the absolute worst. Uh, I probably can't answer that because um, at, the, at the time I was watching them, several of them were the worst. Um, but I mean, we, we could just, just talk about Tammy and the T Rex a little bit. That that movie is is agony to sit through, in my opinion. Um, oh, uh, it was all I could do to even to even sit through the thing. It, it's it's not just a bad movie. I mean, it 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 it, it made me. I mean, it was like one of the Dementors in Harry Potter. I mean, it just made me think like I was never going to have any happiness in my life again. That's how bad it was. It, it's it's such a wrong-headed movie. I mean, it it's it doesn't know what it wants to be. Is it is it some sort of a sexy spoof? Is it a teen movie? Is it a satire? Is it some kind of black comedy? It doesn't has has no clue what kind of film it is. It wants to be. I mean, it's too mean-spirited to be any fun. It's you know, it's too ridiculous to take seriously as some kind of science fiction satire. It's it's just an absolute disaster of a film. I think the worst scene in that whole movie, because I, I, like you, Mark, I've had the misfortune of having to sit for it, and I actually rifted it once, and it was where the hands was dialing the telephone. (laughs) Don't you (laughs) love that scene? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, I don't even know what to say about it. It's it's just an absolute catastrophe of a movie. It, 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 you can't, and it's not a fun. It's not a fun bad movie. It's just a depressing bad movie. Yeah, it, it's not even something that you would watch just for to make fun of. I had a difficult no, I mean, time with it. No, it doesn't it. even have any bad movie fun to it. It's it's just it's just depressing and irritating and unpleasant. Just make it out of your head. The best movies are when they actually tried to make a good movie. Can't make a absolutely movie. yes. You have to try to make a good movie if it turns into a bad. Movie. Yes, I, I yeah. with very few yeah. exceptions, yeah. I'm not a fan yeah. of. Movie. Say again. Uh, say again, uh, Greg. There. I'm just saying, well, what do you think best me exactly? Okay. So, let's see here. Have we got any more questions from anyone else on here? Uh, let's see here. Um, there were two unmade Lost World adaptations mentioned in your book, Mark. Uh, would you like to elaborate a little bit on those? Well, you know, probably pretty much all I know about them is in the book, um, in the in the what that's in the second appendix. Uh, okay. Yeah the the one that that I would love to have seen was the one that Al Whitlock, Albert Whitlock, and Jim Danforth wanted to make. I mean that could have been spectacular. 
Um, that would have been like in the mid '60s, and uh, Jim Danforth was working for Universal, and uh, became friends with with the legendary matte painter and special effects man Albert Whitlock, and um, mm-hmm. they basically just hatched this idea for, you know, hey, let's you know, Al, Al I think Al Whitlock said, you know, I've always wanted to remake the Lost World, and of course that was right up Jan- Danforth's alley, so it was a match made in heaven. And um, they they tried those two guys together tried to get it going. Um, they they pitched it to different studios, to different money guys, and you know for various reasons. Again, the fact that it's it's sometimes it's hard to you know it obviously a, a lost world film if you're going to do it right it's not going to be really inexpensive to make. You're going to have to put some money into it, so it wouldn't have been a low budget movie. And it hadn't been too long since the. 20th Century Fox Lost World with Claude Rains and Michael Rennie and David Hedison and the giant lizards doing dinosaur duty. And uh, I think it was a combination of the kind of the bad taste from that and just the, the budget and the fact that most of the money guys at studios have no imagination. And, um, you know, they, they they gave it the old college tried. Uh, Jim Danforth and Al Whitlock really tried to get that movie off the ground and just could not interest anybody in doing it. It, it could have been fantastic, those two guys working on it. And it's sad to hear, you know, about movies like that that are just great on paper and then, you know, just a turn of bad events happens. Yeah, I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're going to make a, a, lost, a version of The Lost World in the mid-1960s, I mean, who better could you have on it than Albert Whitlock and Jim Danforth? I mean, that's, you know, that could have been great. I believe the 1960 Lost World was Willis Brown's last movie. Well, his actual, the last movie that he actually did any work on was work It's on a Mad, 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 Mad World. Mad, Mad World. Oh, a big epic that. comedy. He was working on a, a brief stop motion sequence when the big fire ladder, fire truck ladder, tilts over and throws all the guys through the window. And he was actually working on that film when he had the heart attack and passed away. It had to be finished by other people. But that, that was his last credit. The Lost World was definitely his last dinosaur film. But, uh, he, and he, but he actually did very little on that, of course, you know, with him wind up using the, uh, the reptiles and no stop motion. Yeah. You know, he, uh, he did some storyboards which weren't used, and he reportedly uh, helped lay out and design some of the split screens and... Uh, and Matt shots, but that's that's he did very little work on the Lost World actually. I thought he did some film in the nineteen. Say again. I'm sorry. Keep breaking up here. He did some of his best films in the nineteen fifties, like the Black Scorpion and the Giant. That was great stuff. Yes, and I agree completely. Uh, there's some great animation in those movies, and the giant behemoth is absolutely, it's actually one of my favorite stop-motion movies or stop-motion dinosaur movies of all. Uh, it's, you know, it's somewhat heretical to say this, but in a way I like it better than I do The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. I love the British angle to it. And, uh, of course, at that point, O'Brien was in his early 70s and was... Basically, he did. He he designed the armatures and the puppets, and he designed the shots and he planned them out. But the actual hands-on animation of the puppets was done by a guy named Pete Peterson, who learned from Obi and uh, had, had started out working on Mighty Joe Young. Yeah, I was going to say, but Harry House and Pete Peterson both worked on Mighty Joe Young. Right. Yeah. I mean, Harry House did most of the animation on Mighty Joe. And uh, O'Brien did a little bit, and uh, and Pete Peterson did some. And there was there were rumors that uh, Marcel Delgado did a little animation on the Lost War- on Mighty Joe, but that's pretty much been debunked over the years. Who did stop motion on Dinosaurus? Well, that was done by multiple animators at Project Unlimited, the special effects house that existed at the time that was founded by Wa Chang and Gene Warren and Tim Barr, and. Uh, the very first person I interviewed when I started writing the book in the mid-90s was Wa Chang. He was my very first interview, and just a super nice gentleman, an amazingly talented man. 
And of yeah, course, one of the things I asked him about was Dinosaurus. And um, on Star Trek. And yeah, well, he did. He did. He did so much work on Star Trek that was never known for years that he did it, and Outer Limits also. Um, but uh, yeah, on Dinosaurus, the actual animation was done by. Uh, I say some of the some of the Project Unlimited in-house animators. Tom Ho- a guy named Tom Holland did a lot of the animation on it. Uh, Dave Powell, who was George Powell's son, did some animation on it. And um, uh, Bill Kellison, I think, did some animation on it. Although yeah. he wasn't, he's not really. He's more known as a miniature builder than the stop motion guy. But um, but he actually worked on it some also. Like you're not going to see dinosaurs in the theater in 81. Oh, I would love to have done that. That's another movie I love, is Dinosaurus. It's a fun movie. Yep. One of the best movie cavemen of all time. Yep. Uh, the jump in with another question from Sam here, Mark. Uh, he was asking uh, about, do you think any what movie would you think would make a good video game and vice versa? Would any video game about dinosaurs uh, be a good movie? Well, I'm, I'm probably going to lose some credibility here, but I'm not much of a video game guy. I kind of got out of video games about the time the PlayStation 1 became obsolete, so that tells you how long ago that was. But um, I'll, I will tell you one thing. One, I was terribly disappointed. I wasn't surprised, but I was terribly disappointed when – they made the first Tomb Raider movie with uh, with Angelina Jolie and did not have a dinosaur in it. Because the dinosaur yeah. uh, part or segment or whatever you want to call it of the video game was by far my favorite part of, of Tomb Raider. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if they actually threw a dinosaur into the, into the movie version? And, of course, they didn't. But that's my biggest disappointment on video games and dinosaurs is that Tomb Raider had no dinosaur in it. But... Um, you know, as far as uh, more more recent things, I, I'm I'm I don't really I can't really answer that because I'm I'm just honestly not that familiar with any of the more recent th- dinosaurs in video games. Well, that's all that's all right. It was just a generalized question anyway, so I don't think it would hurt you. Any. And I I like the answer because I agree. <laughs> I I remember when a uh, Tomb Raider came out and planned trying to shoot those dinosaurs with his off controls and all. Yeah, that, and the next question that, from that would have been a great, great idea. Though. I think I think Tomb Raider would have made about twenty percent more profit if they had just put a dinosaur in it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, here's uh, Greg's next question. He said he would also like to ask the unmade film adaptation of the TV series The Land of the Lost in the 1990s. It eventually, according to what he said, it eventually became the 2009 film starring Will Ferrell. Right, which, if there's one movie with dinosaurs in it that I hate worse than Tammy and the T-Rex, it's it's the Will Ferrell Land of the Lost. But, um, yeah, the the Land of the Lost big screen film, it, it's, it had a lot of starts and stops. I mean, it was... It was on and it was off and Sid and Marty would go and give an interview and they say okay yeah we're actually going to make it this time and then it wouldn't get made yeah. and it, it had all kinds of false starts and and you know early beginnings and and uh, it was with Disney for a while it was with Sony for a while and uh, nobody ever actually made it and it it took Will Ferrell's influence to finally get it green lighted and of course then when they did green light it and actually made it they used the title and a couple of last names, and that's basically the only connection between the TV show and the and the movie that they actually made. Was um, David Gerald involved in any of the theatrical stuff? Was who? Was who? David Gerald from Star Trek. Oh, Trek. no, I don't think so. Um, not that I've ever read, and I, the, the very brief conversation I had with David a few years ago at a at a sci-fi convention, we talked about Land of the Lost very briefly. I was actually on a panel with him, and, and we brought it up, um, and he didn't mention anything about actually having any direct input into any of the aborted uh, feature film versions of it, no. I, 
that, that's that's a big part of my youth, though, that show. I got to do an interview with uh, with Kathy Coleman a few years ago for Film Facts magazine, and that was kind of a geek dream come true for me to, to be able to interview Holly Marshall for a for a magazine after all these years. So that that was pretty cool. What about the Crater Lake? Okay, another question. I'm oh, sorry, Scott. Crater Lake Monster. I didn't quite hear. Oh. Um, was there any sort of films about uh, lake monsters or anything like that Did you got to see, Mark? About what kind of monsters? I'm sorry, it keeps breaking up. Uh like lake monsters, uh, similar to Loch Ness monster and other related creatures. Oh yeah, there's been, uh, of course, there's been a number of movies actually about the Loch Ness monster, and then there's been others that were in that same vein uh, that weren't specifically about about Loch Ness. And uh, some of them are really good, and a lot of them are really bad. Um, in in recent years, there's been a number of Loch Ness movies, and again, the couple that were Loch Ness ish. It weren't really about Loch Ness. Um, the movie that's simply called Loch Ness with Ted Danson from 96, I actually like. A lot of people think it's too kind of old-fashioned and sentimental, but I actually enjoy it a lot. Um, of course, Larry Buchanan, who was well-known as a purveyor of schlock, in fact, he titled his autobiography Tales of a Cinema Schlockmeister, um, and he made the Loch Ness Horror back you know, in the, what I think uh, '82, I think is when that came out, and that's that's a you know, <laughs> that's a that's a bad movie that you can enjoy um, because it it tries so hard and it its heart is in the right place that it just didn't have any resources. But you can actually enjoy it in an affectionate way, unlike you know some of the others that you know you just tend to make fun of. But you can see what Buchanan was trying to do with the Loch Ness uh, Loch Ness horror, and it just he just didn't have the the facilities to do it but but um, and then of course in more recent well, times there's been uh, non Loch Ness monsters there was a movie called Magic in the Water which is a decent little movie it, it, it never really gets off the ground but again it's hard is in the right place there was a movie just a very few years ago called Mishi or Mishi the Water Giant which is another very Loch Ness type story that's set in Canada um, which is actually a again not a bad movie, but pretty be a pretty good family movie to watch with your with your kids. Um, and then there's been of course there's been a Sci-Fi Channel Loch Ness movie which was really bad, and a couple of straight to video ones uh, beneath not beneath Loch Ness beyond Loch Ness. Um, and then there was the bizarre thing that Werner Herzog did a few years ago called Incident at Loch Ness which was kind of a mockumentary. It was one of those movies that's supposed to kind of make you wonder whether you're seeing real uh, a real documentary or is it scripted or is it is it you know is it improvised or what, you know, it's a really strange oh, well. film. We should have waited but there's when you start cooking. Well, here's the uh, last two questions for you, Mark before we wrap this up here. Uh these are from Greg he said that he would like to know uh, what about the unmade Willis O'Brien project uh, called War Eagles, and also how good do you think that Steve Miner's American Godzilla movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters 3D, would have been, in your opinion, if it actually got made? Oh, and there's also a little on that as well. Uh, thirdly, he heard that there was an unmade and bad movie from the 60s and 70s. That was an early draft of the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And if I had Sinbad, Trenton Island, and put it by the historic see what you think about that. So that's three questions there. Okay, I, I heard the first two. I couldn't make out the third one, but let, we'll talk about the first two first here. Um, okay, then. then we'll, we'll go ahead and do that then. Okay. Um Let's see. Now you ask about the Steve Miner Godzilla, and what was the first question? I'm sorry. A war uh, eagle. That's all right. Uh, well, yeah. War, war, eagles. war eagles. Absolutely. Um, well, first on war eagles, I want to start off by giving a plug to a book 
that anybody who is a fan of classic fantasy films, special effects, Willis O'Brien, King Kong, anything in that whole area needs to have this book. It's called War Eagles, The Unmaking of an Epic by David Conover. And it is an entire beautiful book about the unmade war eagles. It has artwork out the wazoo, a lot of things nobody's ever seen before. It has full scripts, the, the multi, you know, the different uh, treatments of the script. It has, it, I mean, it's just a wonderful book, so I highly recommend it. Um, All right. I think it would have been a fantastic film. It would have been spectacular. I mean, with with Cooper, well, Marion Cooper and O'Brien working on it. Um, you know, with with the uh, with the power, you know, the production power that MGM could have brought to it at that point. I mean, they were a very very powerful studio at that time, and um, it, it could have been spectacular. I mean, if you just imagine the climax of that, you know, Art Deco, late '30s New York City, with giant prehistoric eagles dog fighting enemy Zeppelins it was equipped with a death ray. I mean, that is just pulp entertainment to the nth degree right there. That that could have been absolutely <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. But um, the combination of the, of the oncoming tensions of World War II and, uh, you know, again, some of the same thing. Of, it it's always seems to be hard to get imaginative you know, risky films made. Um, right. it, it never got made. Now, World War II probably torpedoed it worse than anything, although it was actually, it actually, you know, tied into the pre-war tensions because the bad guys in it are are Germans not named Germans. I mean, it's obviously that they're supposed to be Germans, although they did, the script never actually called them Germans. They were like Teutonic, a Teutonic race or something like that, but it was clearly meant to, to be Germany. But um, yeah, that would have been something. I, I, that's that's of all the unmade movies of the of the golden age, that's the one I wish most was made. That would have been something to see. And uh, then you ask about the uh, the Steve Miner Godzilla. That that's I think that would have been the best of the unmade Godzillas. I think it would have been a tremendously good movie. Again, based on who was working on it. I mean, and primarily William Stout. The phenomenal artist William Stout uh, was heavily involved in it and did a t- did some beautiful art for it. And um, it, you know, and I interviewed Bill for Horror Show Magazine a few years ago, and basically the whole subject of the interview was unmade stuff. And so we talked about the Steve Miner Godzilla quite a bit, and it was, I mean, it would have been spectacular. Also, you know, the, the, even even not even thinking about the 3D part of it, just the just the scenes that they had planned would have been spectacular in 2D, much less 3D. And uh, it's it's another. It's a shame that that it wasn't made, and then the the 98 TriStar one was made, which I don't know, you know, if any of you guys like it or not. I, I'm not a fan of that movie at all. But uh, I'm not a fan. Uh, to me, it was an interesting idea, it would seem on paper, but when it translated, and it was basically like everyone else calls it, you know, Gino, Godzilla name only. Yes. And the uh, last question Greg had sent in, that was the third question, and I'll reread it here. He said that uh, he had heard that there was an unmade Sinbad movie from the 1960s or 70s. That was an early draft of the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and the plot of Sinbad venturing to an island inhabited by prehistoric animals. And he was wanting to know, do you have any information about that? Basically, you just you just said everything that I know about it. Um, it was apparently that was discussed and. You know, of course, there was the the later Sinbad film that was planned and never made, um, Sinbad on Mars or Sinbad Goes to Mars, whatever the title was going to be, which was uh, another film that Harryhausen and Schneer had talked about making that didn't get made. But yeah, the one with the with the prehistoric island, you know, the fact that it was discussed is about all I know about it. Um, I do know that that Harryhausen's Mysterious Island, which of course was made, it also at was the 
was in discussion for possibly having actual some traditional dinosaurs on it. It's got the giant animals. It's got the giant crab and the monstrous chicken and the gigantic bee and uh, all these modern day animals that have been, you know, increased well, the giantism the giant, by by Nemo's experiment. But um, it, it, at one point, it was actually discussed about having an actual, you know, some actual prehistoric creatures on the mysterious island island. And again, that was uh, just they decided not to go that way. But but yeah, the, as far as the Sinbad. Uh, Possibility, you know, pretty much what you said is about all I know about it. All right. The well, is it's it was a Yep. Repeat that, please. <laughs> I'm having a hard time hearing. Giant bird. Silent was the first regular terror bird. It was a real. Bird. Uh, was in 1976 regarding the decision to exclude dinosaurs from the film. Yeah, I mean, uh, has that ever been definitively proven that 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 was intended to be a terror bird? I know I've, yeah. I've read both ways. Uh, it, it, well, it's it's a great sequence. They, they they could have done with put better music on it. It would have been even better. They they turned it into kind of a cartoony sequence with the music. But uh, my favorite my favorite sequence from Mysterious Island is actually the giant bee. I love the giant bee. Well, giant bird. Well, I think uh, uh, I feel like the interview is starting to wind down now, and so uh, before we wrap it up here, uh, we'll go ahead and see if Greg's got one last question here. Why did you, I'm sorry, my my connection's really getting bad now. Did you say why? Did you ask why there were no dinosaurs in the '76 Kong? Was that the question? Yes, that was it. Um, because the wrong Kong movie got made is why. <laughs> Uh, if Universal had uh, been able to succeed and make their version of it, we would have had dinosaurs all over the place. Um, probably done by Jim Danforth. But um, Dino De Laurentiis, the producer, of, obviously, of the 76 Kong that did get made over at Paramount, was, you know, his, his thrust, his his vision for the movie was all about the love story between Kong and Ann, or Dwan, as she was called in this movie. And it was, it was all about the big monkey, as he called it. And he really had no interest in in establishing Kong's Island as being this this isolated prehistoric environment with all these wonderful creatures in it. You know, I mean, it, you know, he fights the rubber snake, and that that's the extent of the of the island creatures that we get in that entire film. Um, and then, of course, that whole dynamic of of having the girl become, you know, reciprocate Kong's affection and become a, a protector of him, that actually was, you know, carried over into Peter Jackson's Kong, which actually has a lot, you know, it obviously has a lot from the 33 Kong, but it actually has a lot from the 76 Kong in it also, which a lot of people don't mention, but uh, the whole Kong, Kong and the girl re- relationship is in Jackson's Kong is very much like the relationship in, in Dino De Laurentiis' Kong. I kind of got off the question, uh, the subject of the question here. Sorry, but um, yeah, basically it was just because Dino De Laurentiis had no interest in putting dinosaurs in the movie, and um, he wanted it to be all about the big monkey and the girl, and that's that's what he thought the entire story was, and that's that's the way he went, they went with it. Thank you for your insights on that, Mark. 
Well, I I think that pretty much concludes it here for right now, and I think we're all, since we've had to overcome a lot of technical difficulties and all that. I'm <laughs> we've hung in there. <laughs> in, in the ship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, I just want to. We really can, 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 I go just want to say Brad. something here before I go off, if it's okay. Um, for anybody yeah, who's listening to yeah, for anybody who's listening to this. Um, I mentioned earlier that I am hard at work on an all-new revised edition of, of my Dinosaur Ruby book, The Dinosaur Filmography, which is almost 15 years old now. And if anybody listening to this knows of any movies that you think should be in there, basically any movie that has a dinosaur in it, that you think you know they're possibly obscure or unknown enough that I might miss them, let me know. I mean, I'm on Facebook just under Mark Berry. Um, so, you know, let me know. Anybody that, that tips me off to a movie that I've missed that makes it into the book will get a credit in the book. So so if you think to, think of anything that you think I might uh, overlook, uh, look me up on Facebook and drop me a note. All right, then. And I will be sure to be on the lookout for you, as vigilant as ever. And so and that, includes, like to think- that includes theatrical movies, made-for-TV movies, and straight-to-video movies, all three. Then, well, to everyone out there in history, audience, we'd like to say thank you, Mark, for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for your patience as we were working out with the technical issues and all that. And also, I have a personal announcement to make to all of our audience members. This will be my last episode as an active host for the show, and Greg Scott. And Sam and Chris, who unfortunately could not be here tonight to be here, will be taking over the show while I'll be working behind the scenes. So it's been fun and all. And I'm glad I got in on your last show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Then. So, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We will continue our regular podcast here shortly. And I love everyone, and thank you and Mark for being with us. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a lot of fun. All right then. Geico presents sharing versus oversharing. Today, Bridget Griffin shared a video of her daily yoga routine, two self-help articles, and her new blog called Build Your Inner Bridge with Bridge. Girl, your sharing has turned into oversharing. No worries, Bridge. Geico has some info worth sharing with your seven blog followers, like how you could save money on your car insurance, update your policy, and report a claim just by visiting geico.com. How's that for building your inner bridge? Bridge, Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. It's summer. Time to get out. No, way out. And then do it again all summer long. Get to Cabela's Memorial Day sale and kick off the summer with huge savings. Get 50% off Cabela's whooping stick rods and combos and Cabela's deluxe flotation vests. 30% off Coleman Sun Dome tents and 10% off all regular priced kayaks. Plus, find other great deals on grills, coolers, and camping equipment. Don't miss Cabela's Memorial Day sale. 